Ray, nice to see you. The floor is yours. Nice to see you, Nick. Um, from your facilitation at the uh, Yetihad Global Conference, two years running, I've learned a lot. I'm from the master. Hopefully, I'll uh, get I'll a I'll be two learning from you. I'll get a two out of ten. <laughs> You're chief of people, so I'll learn from you now. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this session is focused on globally qualified workforce for the aerospace, aviation, space, and defense industries. So it's very much about talent. Aviation is a people business. Aerospace, space, and defense industries are also people businesses. But there's also an overlap with technology. So it's a double challenge for all of us. Talent is the lifeblood of any organization and any industry. You've got to have a talent flow in, in order to grow your business. At Etihad, we have a very clear strategy. Source, develop, engage, and deliver. So it's focused on finding talent, developing that talent, working on engagement, which is people going that extra mile for the organization, and delivering on the essentials. A key aspect for us is UAE national development. At this stage, we have eight, over 800 students in training. Some of the courses are up to three years long. There's a huge focus on developing national talent. It is a key part of the legacy in this part of the world to develop future leadership and capability and a future leadership backbone for the business. At Etihad, the number one nationality for pilots when you take trainees into account, the number one nationality for pilots is UAE National. The number one nationality for engineers is UAE National. The number one nationality for managers is UAE National. And we've built that over the last seven years effectively from zero. And the overall um, percentage now is 22% of the population. That is a huge investment and a key push on talent. But it's also about creating the culture, a culture of performance, and a culture where you link performance with talent, and you identify the talent, and then you do something about it. Because identifying talent is only one part of it, and it's not the most important part. The most important part is what you do next. If we look at the overall industry and what's happening, in the next 20 years, airlines we'll have to add 25,000 new aircraft. We've heard that spoken about this, this morning to the current 17,000 strong commercial fleet. 25,000 aircraft. By 2026, we will need 480,000 new technicians. 480,000 new technicians. 350,000 pilots. Between 2005 and 2015, 73% of the American air traffic controller population is eligible for retirement. That's a 10-year period where over 70% of that core capability are eligible to move on. In the Middle East alone, there is a requirement for 36,000 new pilots and 54,000 new technicians. Simply stated, demand is outstripping supply. We do not have enough supply to feed the needs of growth in the industry. And that's a crisis. First of all, there are many issues affecting us. But first of all, aviation professions are not seen as attractive. Why is that? Competition with other industries. Talented people can go to many options. When you see, and Nick mentioned earlier about, and Tony Tyler mentioned, a 2.5% margin, potentially, if everything goes to plan, and that we celebrate that, tells you how tight this industry is um, on the aviation side. It's incredibly tight. In typical fashion, and the last speaker spoke about, over the last 24, 20 years, the industry, the aviation sector of the combined industries barely made a profit collectively. 
If everything goes to plan with huge capital expenditure and huge outlay, you might make a 1% margin. These are huge challenges and talented people have choices. In addition, the training capacity is insufficient to meet our needs. The learning methodologies are not there to actually take on the learning challenge. There's a lack of harmonization of competencies. And more particularly, there's little knowledge of the next generation of executive and, and professional. How do we target them? What motivates them? And that's what we're here to talk about today, the broad question of talent. I'll ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves briefly, um, starting with John. Welcome. I'm, I'm John Watrett. I'm the Chancellor of Ember-Riddle Area Nautical University, um, worldwide campus. Uh, with Ember-Riddle's uh, private not-for-profit university dedicated to aviation aerospace, and we have almost 70 degree programs that cover everything from the pilot training, engineering, human factors, management uh, throughout, and from the bachelor's to the PhD level. And I think we do have graduates in almost all the sectors, and especially the sectors that's mentioned here today, the aerospace, aviation, defense, and space. Thank you, John. Ellen? Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Lord, and I'm president and CEO of Textron Systems. We're a defense company, part of a multi, um, a multi um, business conglomerate, Textron. Our products at Textron Systems range from unmanned aircraft systems to wheeled vehicles to smart weapons. The GCC is a very important sector for us, especially the UAE. So I'm very pleased to be here. Hanan? Hi, everyone. My name is Hanan Harhara, and I'm head of human capital at Advanced Technology Investment Company here in Abu Dhabi. We're a company that invests in semiconductors. Uh, over the past five years, we were able to successfully recruit over 200 Emiratis to commit to this industry, uh, as well as um, have over 700 students go through our outreach programs to be uh, interested in science and technology in general. Alan? Hello, my name is Alan May. I'm the Vice President of Human Resources for the Boeing Company. I'm based in Seattle. I've got the privilege of leading some 85,000 employees globally as part of the Boeing Company. Uh, and we have uh, folks all over the world, as you know. Uh, we're going to hire about 10,000 additional employees this year uh, just to sustain the growth of this great industry. And since 2009, I've been actively involved with our teams here in the Gulf states, particularly in the UAE, on a variety of talent development efforts. Adolf? Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Adolf Ide. I'm working for Airbus Group, and I'm heading the HR function for the Airbus Group headquarter, and basically all HR activities outside the four core countries of the group. So I was also heavily involved in setting up our operations, engineering centers in India, uh, our operations in the US over the last couple of years. Thank you, panelists. So let me start with um, the context for how we'll qu I'll ask a number of questions. There are questions from the floor. We'll take it. We want to keep this informal. Most of all, we want to keep it real. It's important that we discuss these topics in a real fashion versus a theoretical fashion. So please, from your point of view, if you're not getting the questions that you want answered, let us know, and we'll ask the right questions. Starting with you, John, the, the shocking gap in availability versus demand that's facing into us over the coming decades, particularly in pilots and, and, uh, and engineers, you know, how can technology and learning help us to tackle this huge issue? Yeah, I th and I think this has been set out uh, well this morning in terms of the, the need for the workforce in the aviation industry. And, and pilots, it is. I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on the need for pilots, the need for maintenance people. But we also see there's a need throughout the whole industry. When you see that the, the building of the new Abu Dhabi airport, the building of the, the Terminal 3 at uh, Dubai, Changi Airport is going to be building another uh, terminal there in, in um, runway. So there's a growth, there's a growth across all aspects of it, not just in the pilots, not just with the maintenance, but all aspects for safety, security, um, the general 
management and, uh, air, and airport operations need to be done. And we can't do that in the traditional way of doing things. And that's why technology now can help us do that. Because technology can bring, bring the training to the learners. They, they can, the training can be done while the, the employee is working there. The new LMS systems for online learning is equal to those of a traditional classroom environment where, where you don't, we don't now need to take students or take, take the, the employees out of the workforce, sit them in a, a university or, or a classroom setting for a long period of time. We can keep them on the position and, and learn on the job and use the, the LMS, the learning management systems we have now, make it very interactive, make it very real to support the learning of the, of the training for all the employees. And, and it is true that the younger generation are comfortable with technology. Technology is, is growing. We all use iPads, we all use uh, I smartphones and use technology. Young people and, and even older uh, adults who are wanting to change careers are comfortable with the technology to learn from it. So we should embrace that into the industry and allow the more training using that technology. We've been doing a long time in the pilot training. The simulation is there. We need to push more with the MPL, which is, uses more of simulation to do that. I think that can help with getting pilots in there. But using other sources of simulation and technology will help the industry as a whole. OK. Thanks for that, John. I feel like a dinosaur with my paper up here. I need to <laughs> focus on that. But with universities, there has been a tendency over many decades for a focus on the academic side. Is there a move, the difference between development and training, is there a move to be more practical in how education and development is, de is, is delivered? Well, there is, because aviation, the aviation industry is a very complex industry. And, and as, we, as it goes, we go further, go forward, technology is coming into all aspects of it. So the, 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 the new employees have to be educated in the use of that technology and, and how to progress through it. Training, and there's a way of saying, training is for the known, education is for the unknown. So we, when we work with training, a lot of the training skills are, we know the prescribed uh, sets of skills that people have to go through, do it step by step, do it repetitive, and then we test them at the end to make sure that they're able to follow those sequence of events through it. And, and training is more an apprentice type training. So the, they, they, they go through, work with a senior manager to get that training. Now, education on the other side, that is going to uh, really aim to broaden that training so that the, the person can, can use the knowledge outside of that just one skill set. So if we, if we bring in more education, education can be done using the technology. So we're bridging the gap between just a training environment and an education environment so that we have a, a, a really well-rounded workforce because it's, it's that, and I truly believe, part of the skill set that, need, that is needed is not just the, the one set of technical training, it's the broad as idea of general education at the bottom so that they can communicate, assimilate the, the information they've got and, and um, report out and use it and think ahead on what they're doing. So it, I think it's important that education is there education can be done so we can have the training aspect, we can get the education, get the degree programs in place now using the technology, using the learning management systems of, of online learning. Online learning is not a taboo subject now and, it, and it's, it's uh, you know, the, the measurable outcomes on what happens in an online classroom are equal to those of a tra traditional setting where the students are sitting in classroom. And, and we always look at it, it, we can look at every aspect of what happens in an online classroom. We can go and see the interaction of an uh, instructor with the student, we can see the interaction with the student to student. We can see the, the number of times that the students are in the classroom. 
on a traditional based uh, course, the instructor walks into the classroom, closes that door, and you only know what happens if something's reported out. So technology really is one way for the future for us to, to bring it in, excite the young people to use that technology as they go into the workforce. Okay, thank you, John. Ellen, as a president and CEO, what is, in your view, the role that the uh, person in your position p plays in the talent game? Obviously, HR people are associated with that push within the business. What is the role of leadership in that? Ray, that's a great question. My number one priority is talent, because talent is absolutely what differentiates our company. So I spend an enormous amount of time not only recruiting, but retaining and developing employees. So I go out to our different sites, I meet with people, I want to talk with them. I spend a lot of time with schools trying to recruit. Our business is 35% international right now, and we plan to grow that more towards 50% international. So obviously our workforce has to come from beyond the United States. Sure. So one of the things that I'm doing is not only putting our employees in country, for instance, we've just moved someone to Abu Dhabi for the transparency, the trust to really grow to be able to do business here, what we then want to do is bring local Emiratis on board into our office and begin to train them so that they can understand our company and we can more effectively work here in the region. I think it's a very important point and worth emphasizing. If you build on what Ellen spoke about there and you look, Jack Welch was probably the preeminent CEO who led the way on the focus on talent. He spent so much time focused on talent and he pushed that agenda and he said this is the key role of leadership and it really is. And if you look not only at what he said but what he did, they used Crotonville which is the business school as the center of strategy development, the center of talent evolution. And Welch famously had his three horse race for the leadership of GE and the succession to him. And if you look at that and the role that we individually play each day in our companies as managers and how much of that is actually spent, as Ellen said, on the talent discussion. So Ellen, what are specifically are you doing on the, for sourcing? You talked about international. How are you making, I know your, your organization has been innovating for 50 years, um, how are you attracting from the competition or against the competition into your, your organization? Ray, we actually want to hire 80% of our employees right out of school or right out of the military and grow them through. So internship programs become mm. extremely important for us. We look at internship programs as really a three-month, two-way job interview. If things go well in the internship, then we immediately after a student's junior year make a job offer. So getting people in early, showing them the exciting things we do, bringing them up through the ranks gives us a very, very strong workforce versus trying to fill at every level. Now, when we look internationally, it becomes a little bit more challenging as to how you attra attract people as you're just beginning new businesses in um, a variety of countries. So what we are doing is working very, very closely with our embassies, whether it be the U.S. Embassy um, here in Abu Dhabi or the UAE Embassy in D.C. We're going in, we're being very transparent about what we're trying to do. We are making clear what the internship opportunities are. And then I like to go out and meet with students at universities. I particularly am committed to bringing women into the workforce, especially here mm -hmm. in the GCC, where there's not quite as much of that. And it's really the connecting with people, getting the word out, making opportunities possible. Because we have exciting jobs. We do innovative things. We can make a difference. So we want to capture that imagination, provide a very exciting experience, and bring people in right out of school. Thank you, Ellen. Hanan has an interesting challenge in that the, the job of the semiconductor industry here is to start an industry from scratch. It's, it's a high-tech 
industry. It, it has incredibly specialist skills that are truly global. And to start an industry from scratch here in the UAE, a high value add industry, while at the same time developing a UAE national capability as you grow the business. Hanam, that challenge. I think we realized the challenge early on, and this really put us an advantage, at an advantage. So what we did, um, while we are starting from scratch here in Abu Dhabi, we do have assets around the world in Singapore, Germany, and the US. And we really used our assets abroad as a platform to train young Emiratis. We've done extensive, extensive market research and we are realized that Emiratis do want to be involved in advanced technology. There is an appetite and it's not just among the uh, young men, but it's also among female Emiratis. So we started early on through programs that started not just at a university or internship level, but really at the middle school. Um, and we worked with students to expose them to this industry. We send them on uh, international internships. We send them on international development programs um, where they're training in our facilities for years, um, about a couple of years, one to two years, depending on where they are. Um, and in this exposure to the um, international world-class engineers, this is where we really think the opportunity lies in truly transferring knowledge, but at the same time building uh, homegrown capabilities. So it, while it's a challenge, we realize that there's uh, extremely um, a lot of opportunities and definitely potential. Um, I, I say it with pride that we have about um, uh, female Emiratis, about four of them working in Singapore right now in uh, Global Foundries, a semiconductor manufacturing facility. How do you generate excitement? I mean, when you s hear the word semiconductor, and I spend time in the industry myself, it doesn't inspire immediate excitement when people understand what it does and how it drives the world. But how do you take a concept called semiconductor, land it into a market like this, and inspire excitement amongst the youth? Like I said, the key here is to start early on. We started as early as middle school. So we get our students to go through these boot camp programs. They have a hands-on experience. Um, they use uh, technology to design chips on their own. And once they get that kind of hands-on experience, that's when they truly realize, okay, this is everything that I can do. And I have an opportunity to be part of this industry. Um, but it requir requires a lot of dedication and hard work. And they're not shying away from that. But the key is um, early. Uh, intervention to capture their imaginations. Thank you, Hanan. Alan, for Boeing, why would an engineer or a scientist pick Boeing versus an IT or social media company that we hear so much about? Well, we're obviously in competition for top talent around the world. And, and you know, when you think about many of us uh, came of age where aerospace was a very exciting field, it was one that was uh, front and center. Uh, and, and now, in many respects, I think we've uh, lost the ability to promote our own business. And we, we often see, despite the interest in aerospace around protecting and connecting people globally, uh, we actually have an um, uh, emerging workforce that has numerous opportunities in many, many different businesses. And frankly, a lot of those industries have done a better job explaining to that emerging workforce what's so exciting about their, their business. So we try to do a few things. Um, first and foremost, we have to get out to the community and describe what it is that we do. And I, I know that sounds very basic uh, with such a, an august audience like this, but the, the reality is most of the young people around the world are bombarded with popular culture and with their images. So we need to get out and really kind of describe that. I think what we also need to do is uh, some things you've already heard on the panel. Uh, we have to work in STEM education very, very early on in a career. Uh, in fact, we have to work it in the school system where children are very young. And not in some purely academic way, but a fun way, like Hanan was mentioning. So that you engage people, not just with their minds, but with their hearts, and inspire them about what aerospace and engineering can really do in the world. And then finally, uh, you know, clearly we need to connect people 
directly, whether it's internships, whether it's uh, other forms of, of, of uh, leadership training programs. These are the kind of things I think would be the prescription going forward to help us scale it up. Now, that might all sound a little theoretical. Um, these are the things that Boeing is doing country by country around the world. We've been doing uh, this within the UAE uh, over the last five to seven years, uh, I think with great success. So whether it's internships, whether it's connecting people at our leadership centers, our version of Crotonville, uh, or in fact, uh, the investment in the community or the schools, I think collectively that will help make things happen. But while we may be a large company, we're just one company. We need to do this with our industry partners. We need to do it more with our government and university partners so that we kind of turn up the volume and get more people excited about this great industry. A case study of Boeing and center of expertise around, built around, let's say, Seattle as an example. Did, did, you f did you find over the decades that actually it became a magnet for talent globally? Um, you know, what is the split between what is organic and what has migrated there because that is the case study which others are trying to replicate to, bring, to build centers of expertise and use talent. Yeah, absolutely. Clearly we have a, a large base uh, in the Seattle area, over 80,000 employees uh, just with Boeing. Uh, many other suppliers, in fact Airbus uh, also is in the Seattle area. So when you build that critical mass it makes it a bit easier. But just as capital has been global, and in fact, raw materials and technology is global. Talent has become global. And over the last 10 to 15 years, we've built those centers of excellence in many, many other countries, whether it's engineers in Russia, uh, whether it's folks doing various development programs in places like uh, India, Australia, or again, right here in the UAE, where we're building a center of excellence around composite technology with Mubadala. So you have to create those talent magnets. And when you do that, you create a greater opportunity for people to interact and that just kind of feeds on itself in terms of building more talent and attracting it to the business. Okay. And where do you see the growth, Alan? What countries do you see growing in aerospace in future, say, 10 years? Well, just with the, the prior presentations, uh, the whole nexus is moving east. And I would suggest it's moving east not just because of the great opportunities here in the Gulf region and other parts of the world. It's moving east because in many of these so-called mature markets, North America and Europe, we have an aging workforce. And in these markets, that's not the case. We have a huge emerging workforce and a great opportunity to build that talent elsewhere. Thank you, Alan. Adolf, we sat uh, Boeing and Airbus together side by side. We thought it'd be a good uh, role modeling. Adolf, you want to talk about the rapid growth that you've had recently in terms of hiring talent. How were you successful in attracting that talent? What techniques did you use? Well, first of all, um, my impression is, after listening to Alan, that our situation and the one of Boeing is very similar. Mm. Uh, maybe, as we said before, we are not necessarily tapping regionally into this, at least in our home markets, our mm. home where we are producing, we are not necessarily tapping on our different talents, but certainly in regions where we are just describing when it comes down to uh, Asia. Uh, I also wanted to make a remark, what you were saying, what do we need to do in order to put this grain into our next generations of being excited about the aer aeronautical and aer aerospace industry? We have exactly the same topics. You need to start early, you need to go to the schools far earlier. Uh, I'm thinking about things we are doing uh, very frequently, our girls' days, uh, inviting school classes, just girls, just to get them uh, confronted in front of, uh, you know, building an aircraft. Uh, the little engineers was is something I think was also being discussed uh, during this, this conference. All these sort of things, which are absolutely necessary. Um, we had, over the last five years, recruited about 16,500 um, employees. And we didn't do this before, so we were coming from a situation, yes, the company was probably known, the product is known, but we were not necessarily very coherent on different job markets. Mm. So it was really a big effort. And we had recruiting activities about 10 years ago, where at the end we find we probably were too much focusing on graduates and not at the right mix mm. of experience and graduates. So we tried to took some lessons around that and also tried to be more using more modern way of recruiting 
which means also being present in all the social medias. We have about, I put, took this number, which is incredible, uh, about 180,000 plus people are connected on certain social media platforms where we are today actually present. Um, it is working on our brand and, and image at, the, at different fairs, at different university fairs, on the big air shows, and really putting this image across what this company is about and what a great place is to, to be. So one is certainly uh, branding of the company. Um, we actually centralize completely our recruitment activities in, in Europe. One recruitment center, the same process, we were trying and we, uh, we were successful in speeding it up before we needed, you know, in our big companies are some, you know, sometimes are extremely big where you need 17 signatures to release an, an RFP. Uh, we tried to reduce this to three, which eventually we actually managed and get our recruitment lead time down to offer to a candidate to 35 days, where sometimes we were at 80 or 90 days. And obviously in um, intensifying also our relationships with a number of universities around the world, trying to tap on their talents when they um, recruitment fairs, for example, and trying to keep a stable number of internships which always is a good source for recruitment of roughly 3,000 a year. Okay, excellent. How important is diversity in such a hiring pitch? In this part of the world, diversity is a given just by the nature of what happens here. And at Etihad, we have 142 nationalities. How important is that diversity push as you go on a big hiring spree? It's interesting. You say 140, we have roughly 120. And people think, wow, that's big. But obviously, when you look down to the figures, and when we're thinking diversity and global, also, we need to understand where this company is from and where we actually based. I mean, Airbus, Airbus as a group, at, uh, including commercial aircraft, including defense activities or helicopters, we are a European company. We are based in Europe. Yeah. But the thing is, 95, 96% of our growth, of our order intake is for other parts of the world, especially here and, as you were saying, going, going east, while at the same time, 95% of our workforce is in Europe. It's still in, in Europe. So global means as well thinking global. And we had a big debate uh, a couple of years ago when we were setting up certain activities in India, in Russia, and in other places, how are we going to globalize this company? Mm. And there was a strong stream in our company saying, let's get the hundreds of, en of, um, of Indian engineers and maybe thousands and bring them to Toulouse to globalize our engineering workforce. You can see already my reaction is I don't think it's the right way of doing it. Uh, so I think when you think about engineering and talents, you should also go there where the talents are. That was the reason why we opened up our activities in India, in China. We have an engineering center in Russia, in the US, in, in Wichita, and in Mobile, uh, Alabama. So not bringing them all to Toulouse, but doing it the other way around. It's absolutely important. But as well, when you do these hirings, I don't like the word probably I prefer the word targets. You need to give yourself certain targets in recruitment. You could use the word quotas, but quota sounds uh, very strong. But at the end of the day, if you don't do this, I had this colleague who told me last week, I hate quotas, but I love the results of it. Mm. And when we think about that the European engineering schools are releasing every year, every year between 15 and 20% women engineers, we try to reflect these numbers in our recruitments, as an example. Yeah. Uh, the same in what are our targets for non-national hires. We would like to have more uh, non-nationals, but obviously not in the numbers we were just discussing, just bringing the big hundreds of, of engineers Thank you, to Toulouse. Questions from the floor. Um, we've got mics, and mics are available. Anybody got a question they'd like to ask the panel? Question here. Oof. It's okay, no, here at the front. I was one there. We have one mic, do we? <laughs> okay, and then come back here. You can shout. I'll shout. Yes.
could just maybe summarize quickly for everybody in the room. So the question was, technology great, but face-to-face -face contact and learning is a huge part of the growth. Um, and, and the question is, do we lose some of that? You do lose some. However, with the changes in the use of technology, it is that synchronous, asynchronous piece is still there. We've got, you know, you, you, you have uh, the learning management system, which is the asynchronous piece, but you've also got video conferencing now. And, and video conferencing, the, those are all linked together that you can do group work within an online setting um, for, for most of the, the general learning part of it. But it's true, the, the, the lab piece has to be, you know, hands-on. However, there is a lot of virtual labs. L virtual labs coming into play now that you can use. We actually have just developed um, a virtual crash lab, where, and it's based on a, a, a flight that occurred in the US and using data, and it, uh, it is built using gaming theory and, and all the things, and the, so the students can take it they can walk in, walk through the cr crash site, they can take the measurements, they can do all the analysis that the crash investigation would do, similar to the NTSB, because we took that from there. So they are getting that hands-on experience in a virtual uh, environment, and they can still interact with their colleagues as well, or the other students in there, or do it as a group setting. Okay, thanks, John. We have a second attempt at the mic. Question? Good. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ray, and thank you for the panelists, uh, uh, for the uh, informat uh, informative discussion in regards to the challenges we're facing uh, uh, in regards to attracting uh, the new generation sure. for the aviation industry. I mean, my, my question maybe for Ray, uh, we have uh, it can have, have a huge order of aircrafts, maybe 200 approximately in the next uh, coming years. And the, the, at the beginning of your speech, uh, actually you gave a scary numbers of the required number of uh, uh, engineers, technicians, pilots for the, for the region. You talked about 40,000 or more than that. Mm. Now my, my question, does it had, uh, have uh, solid plan in regards to uh, attracting the new generation to, uh, to the field of aviation, uh, yeah. at least in the country? Yeah. No, I think it's at the core that your question is at the core of the challenge that we have. I think that there are a number of things. First of all, this part of the world is hugely attractive. What we've seen over the last number of years is a huge movement of talent eastwards and young people coming eastwards out of Europe, in particular with what's gone on, and also out of the US. That's happening. If I look at Etihad, for instance, from an unknown brand six, seven years ago, in a 12-month period now, we have one quarter of a million applicants online. 250,000 people worldwide click online to join Etihad Airways. So the, 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 there's no question that there is there is certain, there's interest, it's finding the talent in those huge numbers and building the programs. So what we've done, and in particular the UA national side, is, um, is create programs that build over multiple years. Some of these courses take six years. Right now we have 800 people in training, we'll grow to 1,000 by the end of the year, and then we'll move to 1,500 and 2,000. And you have to have that kind of throughput. Where you have the biggest challenge, not on the pilot side because there's a natural interest, but on core skills like engineering, where you have to, as Hanan said earlier, you have to start a spark early. You have to get into the schools in the junior grades. You know, for us, we, we bring in UA national pilots in uniform, young people in uniforms that people in the classroom can relate to. And you start to, to sow the seed of a dream to be part of the national airline. You have to use every technique possible because of the numbers. The numbers tell us that mathematically we've got a, a problem. We will continue to be attractive here because of growth, because of technology in terms of the newness of what we've got, because of things like you know, mobility and promotion and command positions for pilots. So that's attractive. We have that, but the numbers are still scary in terms of 
the amount of homegrown that we need to do. Good question. Any final question from the audience? Two over here. Are you okay to take them, Nick? We'll Say it. Two, we have two questions over here. Can we? Uh, it's oh. their lunch and yours. Oh, see how hungry people are now. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have reminded them. <laughs> we'll take two quick questions and let, and let people escape to lunch. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, quick question about uh, we, we're seeing we're talking about the huge number of uh, demand that need, needed in the sector. But we also like look at the unemployment reports we're getting from all over the countries, uh, countries around the world, not just uh, in this region. And uh, so I'm not I'm not connecting the gap. So we, we need people, but at the same time there's like unemployment rates across the region. So what's what's the what's the connection here, and how can we close that gap and basically connect the dots? Yeah, Ellen, would you like to have a go with this? Absolutely, thank you. There is a disconnect between skill sets and capability and what is ready there for a job. And I think industry, for its part, needs to continue to speak up and forecast what those skill sets are needed um, for the future. Because there is a certain amount of general education that's very important, but you also need people that have the math skills, that have the science skills, that have the engineering skills. So I think it's twofold. The educational system has to reach out to industry, and industry has to reach out to the educational system. Okay, thank you. Hanan, would you like to comment just on the great work that Tauteen, for instance, does here and the partnership between Tauteen and, in and industry? I think that's critical. The point that you mentioned, Alan, about uh, um, industry working very closely with academia to design programs that are relevant to what the market is uh, asking for, that's critical. And, and I think here in the UAE, we have those really good relationships in place that enables us to really work towards bridging, bridging this gap um, and, 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 I'm, and I'm sure, and I'm, again, it's not just the part of one specific industry, I also think it's the combined industries that are working within the science, technology, engineering, and math um, area that need to come together to address the, um, the gap. Okay, thank you. There was another question over there. Sweet. And then one more there. I'll try to keep it quick, but um, my question is regarding career path for these larger organizations. A lot of time you have to spend quite a few years to get to um, an advanced position, let's say it's some, someplace like Boeing or Airbus. And how do you, how has that changed to attract some of the top talent, you know, when you're competing with something like Silicon Valley where you can go there and you can, you feel like you make an impact, let's say directly after college versus being stuck in a career path that might take you 10 years to get the same satisfaction. Well, I can answer that quickly, then I'll throw it to the panel. Just come to Etihad Airways, <laughs> and we'll give you lots of mobility, lots of opportunity. Um, Alan, do you want to take that from the... Yeah, just, uh, just briefly. I, at times, the industry, particularly the larger players, have been known to move, let's just say, at glacial speed on careers. Um, but some of the factors we've been talking about here today mean that that's no longer acceptable. So a couple things briefly that we're doing in Boeing, a lot of accelerated development programs for our high potentials. Uh, taking not just our interns uh, but, uh, and, and hiring them, but making sure that they have some unique experiences very quickly the first few years of their career. The other key part of that, and I urge those of you in the audience that, that lead organizations, you've got to spend your time. You've got to spend your time identifying these people, mentoring these people, and pulling them through the organization because the muddle in the middle w will not do it. You, know, you really have to reach down in the organization and spend time doing it. Fortunately, we've got a, a culture at Boeing where our leaders do spend a lot of time on that whole development process and pulling that talent through. Ellen, as the CEO, you have a view on this? Just a quick follow-up. I think this is spot on. This is an issue that industry understands, and I'll give you an example of how Textron's looking at that. In the last 24 months, we took a small group of people, including many early career people, put them on a special project, a very secret project, where they went from a clean sheet of paper to first flight of a light attack jet in 24 months. That would not have been possible doing things the traditional way. So what we do is we look for good opportunities because we understand we have to inspire people. And that was a great example of how I think we were successful. 
Okay, we're out of time and I can hear rumbling stomachs from the audience, but you know, I think in, if I could summarize what I'm feeling from the discussion with the, with the panel is there is a huge push on the talent agenda and over many decades, this was an agenda that was nice to do and now it's clearly need to do. And what you're seeing in my view is a new energy around this because in, in the past, it, w it was to some extent a, a uh, ticking box exercise. And as we know, necessity is the mother of invention. And what we're seeing here is businesses who have a huge need, huge gaping holes in what they need to, to fuel future needs. And therefore, you're seeing the innovation coming out and the pull. If you listen to some of what is happening from the panelists, it's pretty much anything goes in order to win in the talent game. And that's a great time for people coming into the industry. I think the aerospace industry needs to set its stall out in a much more integrated fashion, in a much more confident fashion. Margins are not necessarily the only thing top graduates should consider clearly when they're moving into an industry. The excitement of this industry, the global nature of it. When people get into it, they can't leave it. They don't want to leave it. And that is what we need to do working, in my view, much more collectively together to push this agenda. Nick, over to you.